Hello and welcome to Captains of Industry. I'm Chris Bishop. Now this uh, week we have a, a captain of industry in the property world, a man by the name of Thierry Delvaux. He's had a fairly varied career. He's currently the Chief Executive Officer, Middle East and Africa for JLL. But before that, he's worked in Hungary, Romania. He speaks five languages, including Hungarian and Japanese. He had a varied life indeed. Thank you very much for joining me. Very welcome. And uh, just, just a little bit about your roots. You were born and bred in Liège in Belgium. I mean, what kind of an upbringing did you have? Oh, uh, you know, I mean, first, Belgium is a small country where they speak three languages. And you, you've, I'm sure you heard about the cultural differences that we have in that country. But the good thing about Belgium is it, it gets you um, it creates, I would say, very multicultural people. Uh, so very, very early days, learning French, the Dutch, which is Flemish in mm. Belgium, um, and living in a beautiful country, which I left quite a, quite a long time ago now. So you, you had a desire to move. Where, where did your, your life and your career uh, take you out of the country? It started by, uh, by uh, moving and traveling to Japan and spending a couple of years in Japan when I was 19 years old, actually. Uh, I was still at, uh, in, in school, and I had the desire to live in a very different world and learn about different culture. And obviously Japan has a very different culture. <laughs> what was it like? I mean, you were a teenager there. You had to learn the language, obviously, um, which you did successfully. It must have been a real shake-up of the system, wasn't it? I will always remember the first night when I arrived there. I was living with a host family, and I was like, what am I doing here? They were not speaking any English, uh, so I could not really communicate with them, which actually helped me learn very quickly the language. But uh, the first couple of months were really hard. But then I would say today, if I look back, it's the best experience of my entire life. What did you take from Japan, you think, that, that you incorporated into yourself in the world of business? Um, trying to adapt to the different cultures around the world and never be judgmental, but understanding that we're not all the same, and we just need, if, if you want to succeed in business, you need to adapt to the people you're doing with business with. That's, I guess, what, what are the most important things that I, that I learned in Japan. And um, then from Japan, you uh, ushered in, your, you studied more, and then you ushered in your career. And was it always the property game for you? Um, I started working with a, um, a small Belgium company that was exporting to Japan and I was in charge of, of the Japanese market. Uh, so I was using my Japanese a lot and traveling there a lot. But that was like a, a three year gig until I fell in love with the property industry and I moved to, uh, to the company I'm still working for today. Yeah, and it's a monster of a company as well. It's in the Fortune 500, $16.3 billion in uh, operations in 80 countries, 92,000 people. Um, it's an uh, amazing thing, but you did your apprenticeship in Europe as well. Um, when you were still quite young, you went to Hungary and Romania. Now, it must have been quite an exciting time. It was in the early 2000s, as I understand it, and Berlin Wall had come down a decade before, and the property market was going mad. Just tell us. The property market was going mad. You know, they were opening their borders uh, to people, but to businesses. And we've experienced a massive capital flow uh, from corporates, but also from investors in the country. So those were really the golden years. Uh, the challenge, though, is they were not used to, uh, uh, to the free market. It was all, all new to them, and uh, there's been a lot of time spent to actually teach our own employees how to sell business. Uh, but that was an ex extremely uh, exciting experience. Okay, you say golden years. How were people making money in those heady days? Well, they were making money because, uh, because, you, because of, thanks to the, the investors entering the market and investing money in those, in those countries, uh, Otherwise, uh, it's, uh, I would, being very candid, I would say that uh, um, if you compare, for example, to Hungary to Poland today, uh, Poland very quickly uh, got into the groove of, of becoming a very open and successful economy. Hungary has taken its time to get there, I would say. What have been the impediments uh, in Hungary? Um, I think it's cultural. 
I think you know Hung Hungarian is not a language that sounds or look like any other languages in the world, and their culture is also extremely different. You can't compare their culture to it to uh, any other cultures around the world. So I think adapting to my earlier point, uh, adapting to the European culture, the American cultures, and all those investors entering the market has been a, quite a challenge for uh, for the Hungarian market. So is it essentially, was it like sort of selling former state? own properties in the free market. Was that the, the, the basis of it or was it more complicated than that in Hungary? I would say that was the basis of it. Basis of it right? yeah. And people made fortunes. I mean, uh, did people go in there with $500 and <laughs> come out with $5 million? I mean, just tell us, give us a, share with us a few stories. Yeah, absolutely. Because, the, I mean, if you look at the property market, you had the, the stock of, of quality and modern properties was extremely limited. Uh, but the demand from corporates wishing to enter the market uh, was very high. So the very first pioneers, the very, very first developers in the market made a fortune <laughs> because they you know, built modern properties and they were let and occupied in no time at very high rents. And uh, a lot of now, a lot of people got their fingers burnt in those days. <laughs> Can you have to share with us a couple of examples where people didn't quite understand the market and went in and lost a lot of money? I would say, you know, I would say it's more on the investor side. Um, a lot of the institutional investors in Europe moved to Eastern Europe because the returns were very exciting. Uh, but slowly, the returns became less and less exciting to a certain point that the returns were the same as the one that you would get in London. And then people started to think, why am I there? Why am I in that market, which is much more risky? Than a, London, than a market like London. So they all disappeared, they all left, <laughs> and the market crashed. And uh, what kind of risks were there? I mean, apart from the sort of lingering maybe state regulation and control, what, what, what were the risks in the property market in those days? Um, I mean, it was all, the economy was the risk. Basically, the economy was not booming anymore. And if the economy is not booming, the corporates don't grow. Don't, they don't need more space. They actually shrink and take less space, and suddenly the, more the, the property market crashes. This is exactly what happened. I think there were too much um, uh, excitement uh, for those new markets in Eastern Europe, uh, but the economy, the growth, didn't follow, um, and that's why some people burned their, their fingers. But I would say now it's pretty much sta stabilized. We're talking about. Um, early 2000s. You know. mm. oh, well, 20 years later, you say that Hungary has sort of developed into a, um, a sort of slick, fairly slick property market, but Romania is still lagging behind. What's happening in Romania? I mean, I think Romania has always been uh, quite a few years behind uh, the likes of Hungary, Czech Republic and Poland uh, in the way they, uh, their cities are developed, especially the infrastructure infrastructure has been lagging in Romania uh, and is still lagging today. And without inf infrastructure in that part of the world, it's very hard to, to really um, boost the economy and the business in, in the market. I think infrastructure is probably one of the key reasons why they're still behind. And then when your days were done in Hungary and Romania, what was your next challenge after that? Moved to Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very different. <laughs> Extremely mature and established market. And <laughs> just looking back on those days, what, uh, you know, can you give us an example of exactly the difference that there was between the two markets? Well, um, if you are in, in the U.S. and you want to know the price of a, of a piece of real estate, you just go online, you type the address, and then you have the list of all the people who bought that particular house over the last 20 years, mm. it tells you exactly how much they paid. So the market is so transparent that every piece of information is public. And if you compare it to Eastern Europe where uh, the transparency was not exactly the same, if you will. So uh, <laughs> uh, very, very, very mature market uh, indeed. And uh, that was uh, about what, what, what year was that when you were over uh, 2010. Okay. So were people still making money? Uh, bearing in mind uh, we, uh, there was so much turmoil going on then still in the world markets. The 2008 crash had just happened. How, how was the, the U.S. market shaping up there? Uh, I, I will tell you something. My, my 
uh, as, a, as a citizen of, of the globe, my biggest takeaway in the US is their ability to, uh, to look at difficult situations uh, from a positive perspective and bounce back very quickly. Um, I will always remember being sitting on a, at a board meeting in the US and we were planning the five years ahead and I was like, hey gentlemen, do you, don't you think that there's going to be a crisis coming? And the response was, oh, you being too European here, there's going to be a crisis and we'll bounce back and the year after we'll, do, we'll make even more money. That's the American attitude of bouncing back very quickly and always look at the opportunity even in a crisis time. And uh, it was misplaced, I assume. Uh, you still believe? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, you also have to be, uh, uh, you shouldn't be naive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, anywhere you go in the world and spend time and learn new cultures, you learn how to be a, a better, you know, world citizen, I would say. So <laughs> it's my learning is continuing and now, now it's in Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's what we're going to be talking about in the second half, the business here in the Middle East and Africa. I'm talking with Thierry Delvaux, the Chief Executive Officer, Middle East and Africa at JLL. Do stay with us on this edition of Captains of Industry. You're with Captains of Industry and I'm Chris Bishop and I'm talking to Thierry Delvaux, the Chief Executive Officer, Middle Eastern Africa at JLL, a man embroiled in the property game in this country and also in Dubai. Thank you very much. So the market now, uh, particularly let's start with Africa when we're in here. We get lots of CEOs, lots of companies coming in here in the property game. All of them virtually all say they're struggling right now. Uh, how do you see the property market here? You know, I mean, if you look at Africa and you look at the, uh, the commodity market, it's pretty volatile and therefore it has, a, um, it has the same impact on the economies. So if you want to be in Africa, you got to go for the long term. The short term doesn't work. Uh, you got to believe in it. You got to be ready to go through the storms. And you got to think that in 20 years time it might be the only region where you get a double digit GDP growth. So if you look at long term, I think, um, I would say I'm very optimistic about uh, the African market. These days, uh, if you look at the South African market, it's struggling. Um, but uh, we're, we're here and we're very committed to this market. I mean, a lot of uh, the, the property companies that come in for interviews at CNBC Africa, they say they're having to sort of give people discounts and all kinds of things to hang on to their customers. They've lost a lot of people. A lot of things are changing in the market here. People are now got these virtual offices. They don't need huge suites of offices anymore. How, how do you see the industry evolving as it tries to uh, prosper and survive here? Mm -hmm. um, the real estate market and the real estate industry as a whole is going through a transformation, is being completely disrupted. And I think that in any, any time during a crisis, you have to reinvent yourself and you have to innovate. You just mentioned it yourself. A lot of companies are going to take space in flex space. Mm. That's a massive opportunity for Africa, for example. How many uh, uh, operators are actually trying to offer flex space in Africa? Not enough. Mm. So again, the way I see it is you have to reinvent yourself. You have to innovate. Um, but if you come with the traditional way of developing commercial properties in Africa and you go through a tough time, you lose money, that's for sure. I mean, uh, that's another thing here. I mean, a lot of the, the shopping malls, which used to be the trademark, as you know, of the, uh, um, the, the property business here, a lot of them are struggling, you know, empty stores, um, not enough clients, people shutting down, rents too high. Uh, what do you see the future of, of the shopping mall in this, uh, in this t country in particular? You know, first, um, the future of shopping malls in a, in a world where you buy online mm. 
Um, I personally think that anything that is not an experience will be bought online. If you want to experience something, you'll go to shopping mall. If you want to buy um, a car or luxury goods, you'll go to the shopping mall. Everything else, in the next 10 years, you'll buy it online. So I think that's going to disrupt the retail market very much. Um, the other thing you were talking about, paying too high rent, uh, in the future it'll be turnover based mm -hmm. rather than, than, than a rental level. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the retailer is successful, the developer or the owner will make a, p a part of that profit really? as a rent. So it'll be linked to a percentage to your turnover rather than this is what you open with, really? That's where I think we're going. When is that going to take root, you think? Because it's all fairly traditional here, as you know, at the moment. It, if you look outside of Africa, it, ho it has already started. And what actually has changed and has driven that new trend is oversupply. Mm. And we see oversupply in a lot of key markets in mm. Africa here. So I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised that one of the next uh, trend is to start seeing Turnover rent. Uh, would your your company consider it here in Africa? Yeah, absolutely. You would. Yeah. So you think it's coming? Yeah, huh? I definitely think so. Okay, and another uh, is aspect as well um, that's um, making news here at the moment is nothing restaurants. I mean, there's always been this big restaurant trade here, uh, particularly in places like Johannesburg. But um, a lot of people now are investing in these virtual kitchens and all this home delivery stuff. And I don't know. It's only a question of time when I think the restaurant space is going to start collapsing as well. How are you reading it? Exactly the same answer that the previous question. If you're looking for an experience, uh, if you're going to a rooftop or a restaurant on the beach, you want to go there because of the experience. Everything else will be just like the online market. It'll be a phone call and they'll bring the food to you. And that's why there's there is a market now for those kitchens where literally they cook 15 different mm. cuisines mm. Uh, and you just decide which one you want and they'll, they'll deliver it for you. What about the rest of the continent? Um, there's, you know, the Jew is still out in some countries here where the property market's going. I know it's not sophisticated in many countries. Where are you seeing the growth areas here on this continent? Um, there's a market that has been doing pretty well, which is Ghana. Uh, in, in the last couple of years, we got some pretty good traction there. Um, I would say that um, uh, Nigeria is obviously still a big market that has been going through ups and downs, mm. we know that. But the critical mass of Nigeria is there. Mm. So uh, there is a lot of business. Uh, and big Fortune 500 corporates have to be in Lagos. They have to be in Nigeria these days. So there's quite a bit of, a, of activity. But again, um, it's volatile. And long term, though, I mean, you think you should be investing in, I say, Nigeria and Ghana now for 20 years' time returns? Um, the, way we, uh, the way we vision our business is not so much on a geographical basis in Africa, but it's more client and project centric. Mm. If there is a big project in Mozambique because there's gas there, that's where we should uh, support our clients. Uh, equally, if, if something happens in Ethiopia, that's where we will be. So it's supporting our clients rather than focusing on a particular geography for the reason that I explained before, the volatility of the markets. But overall, we have teams knowing pretty well all the markets in, uh, in, um, in Africa. And we are actually slowly, uh, we're very strong in research, for example. We're investing a lot um, making the market more transparent because we think that it'll pay off in 20 years when suddenly those markets are more mature and really take off. And talking about transparency, how many countries, I know South Africa does it, where you can go and find out exactly how many times the property sold, how much it was sold for, and all the uh, forensic details. Are there are many countries in the continent that can do it? Very few. Probably of this Very is just few. one. Very few. Yeah. And uh, moving to uh, Dubai as well, um, every time I go there, there's new buildings going up. You can always watch them uh, go up as you, uh, as you stay there. But um, it seems to me still there's quite a boom going on despite world conditions in Dubai. Um, what are the areas that are the basis to invest at the moment? I would say first, you have to see Dubai as the only, the unique market in the world that defies the law of supply and demand. 
So Dubai is a 50-year-old, a 50-year-long project. What does that? What does it mean? We're not building, considering do we have the demand for that particular asset. We're building, and they will come. So they invested in a. I mean, world-class infrastructure, knowing that this will attract people to move in. Uh, and this is really what happened. So the cycles of, real, of the real estate cycles in Dubai don't really matter. Yes, they're going through ups and downs like other, other markets, but they're looking, they're looking at the end goal. Um, so if you look at the markets right now, it's pretty oversupplied in residential, commercial, and retail as well. Um, but if you look at the residential market, the, s the volume of the sales is still massive. Mm. I mean, in nine months, in 2019, um, about $15 billion of, uh, of, of sold apartments to investors. 81% mm. of the apartments sold in Dubai are sold to foreigners and in foreign investors. Uh, so, um, and actually the trend, um, at, at JLL, we've been focusing on Africa, and we sold quite a bit of, uh, of investment opportunities to uh, African high, high net worth personalities here. So it's a trend. And when it comes to the, the investment crossover, I mean, what's the proportion you think of people in Dubai investing in Africa and the other way around? I mean, which ways are the, the scales tipped? Um, I, th I would say that uh, Dubai and the Middle East is investing more and more in Africa. Mm. And the reason is um, they see the opportunities. If you look at that famous airlines that has its headquarters mm. in, in, mm. in Dubai, it's so easy to travel to Africa. In fact, it's probably easier to travel from Dubai to a lot of capital in Africa than it is from Johannesburg, mm. to be honest. So um, I think the access to the key markets in Africa and the opportunities that, uh, that a lot of Middle Eastern developers have seen is the reason why you see a lot of our clients now investing in, uh, in Africa. And now you've got Expo 2020 arriving uh, next year in just under a year's time. And there's going to be a flood of people. I mean, was it like 10 million visitors alone uh, likely to make their way there? A hundred odd thousand hotel rooms will be made for them. I, how is it going to give the uh, property market a lift, you think? Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to, to say what number of, uh, how many people will actually come. But I'll tell you that I'm a believer in Expo 2020. And the, here's the reason. Uh, because Dubai, they put, they invested enough to make it what they call now the greatest show of the world. So it's going to be all about the future. It's all going to be about artificial intelligence. I think this is going to be a revolutionary uh, expo. Uh, and for whoever has never been to expo before, that's the one to go to. Now, is it going to change in short-term pricing in Dubai? I'm not so sure. Is it going to boost investment in Dubai, especially mm. in the residential sector? I think so, yes. You think it will? Yes. Without a doubt. Yes. Uh, and what, what sort of uh, areas of the world, what continents are looking towards Dubai as an investment or even a place to live? Uh? So you have to, 30% uh, of the world population lives within four hour flight of Dubai, mm. right? So it's a very central location uh, that attracts Asians, um, a lot of Asians. I mean, if you go to Dubai today, it's flooded with high quality Chinese tourism. You know, so Chinese tourists are really interested in Dubai. But you will look, you know, Brits, Germans, I mean, Europeans are there. Um, so I would say a good mix of Europe and Asia, but let's not forget the GCCs, <laughs> you know, the GCC countries. Dubai is the place to be. So you will still have a lot of Saudi and GCC uh, investors continuing to invest in Dubai. Well, on that hopeful note, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on this edition of Captains of Industry. I've been speaking to Thierry Delvo, the Chief Executive Officer, Middle East and Africa for JLL on the property business in Hungary, Romania, Washington, D.C. and Dubai and Africa. So uh, we got it all in there. But uh, now uh, from me, Chris Bishop and the crew on this edition of Captains Industry, it's goodbye.